Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 78, I chat with Fred Marr, DTS audio guy, about Neo X and 3D audio. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded August 29th, 2011, episode 78, Massively Multi Channel. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of hometheater.com. This week's guest geek is Fred Marr, a musician, recording engineer, and producer currently working as a consultant for DTS on their new NeoX algorithm. Hey, Fred, welcome to the show. Hey, Scott, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, too. Uh, we met first at uh, CES, I believe, uh, where I interviewed you for uh, the coverage that we did for Twit. And I'm so glad to have you back on the show to talk in more detail about NeoX and uh, some other interesting audio stuff. Those, mm -hmm. of you who are tuned, those of you who are tuned into the live video stream at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Fred, and I'll pass on as many as I can. Speaking of ch the chat room, I have not yet logged in, so let me do that so I can see everybody in the chat room. And uh, here we are. So, hello, chat room. Um, <coughs> and uh, Chipper Dog says, "I look squished." Have we got the? Uh, have we got the? Um, uh, yes, you look squished. I look squished. Yeah. So anamorphically, we're hopefully. Uh, is that going to just be the way it is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is the way it's going to be, folks, for this show. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I guess it's good for me since it makes me look like I lost a little weight. But uh, in any event, um, <clears throat> let's get on with the show. Fred, um, according to your bio, you've worn many hats in the audio world. You're a musician, you're a recording engineer, a producer, an A&R exec, and a consultant. How in the world did you get started doing all this stuff? Uh, well, uh, I should point out actually that I'm, I'm not actually a consultant for DTS anymore. As of just this last January, I'm, I'm full time here. Oh, uh, an employee. In, okay. And I'm an actual employee uh, working in the uh, R&D department, which is really fun because oh, really that means fun. I get to, yeah, get to play around with all kinds of crazy futuristic stuff. I get to be the, the space monkey. <laughs> you probably work with uh, J.J. Johnston then, huh? Yes, that's right. He was a guest on the podcast uh, quite a few episodes ago, but uh, yeah. he gave us some indication of what he was doing, so it'll be great to get your perspective as well. Yeah. Um, so, okay, yeah. so you're, a, you're an employee now, but uh, <clears throat> as I said, you've done many things. Uh, you were a musician. You played in a number of bands that uh, a lot of people might have heard of. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was in an '80s pop band called Scritti Politti. Uh, uh, I remember that group. Yeah, <laughs> I think we had one big, massive MTV hit, and uh, that was back in the day when things were a bit more regional. So you could be really you know, like huge in Oregon, and nobody knew who you were in you know New York City. And <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, most people in, in in Southern California at least seem to seem to remember the scritty but yeah i moved on from that into uh into production i was a, a drummer originally played with uh lou reed um uh, a bunch of obscure new york bands one mm -hmm. called material mm -hmm. um did you play on then, uh, the, the big lou reed sh song i remember is um uh walk on the wild side did you were you the drummer yeah. on that one no, no, I'm not quite that old. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually uh, I played on an album called t two. Well, three of his albums. One was called Legendary Hearts. One was called New Sensations, 
And then later on, uh, after Scritty, after I got into record production, uh, I actually uh, produced uh, an album called New York, which was sort of a comeback album for him. And I think mm -hmm. the best known song off of that record was called Romeo Had Juliet or uh, no, Dirty Boulevard. I don't know. I don't know. But, okay. But yeah. Great. And then I, I, I liked it in the studio better than being on the road. And I was fascinated by the technology and um you know you're asking how did i wind up being a consultant for all these sort of technology based companies uh i i just love technology i'm you know um, a I'm, true I'm, geek I'm you, in other words a true yeah a true geek a true <laughs> <laughs> mostly self-taught uh you know i was the first uh person to one of the first uh, producers to start using Pro Tools way back in 92, you know, when oh, it was only, man. You know, eight or 16 tracks and fought through that. And uh, eventually I always worked my way into becoming a, a beta tester because I come up with so many uh, bugs and problems with things. Um, and then I also, would, I'd, I'd be the guy that everybody would call like, hey, how do you do this, time code this, word clock that. And mm -hmm. So it's just, uh, it comes naturally to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, very good. Uh, <clears throat> so you uh, you ended up being a uh, an engineer and a producer, uh, yeah. even an A and R guy, and um, yeah. at uh, Electra Records. So you've covered Correct. the gamut of the, of the audio world. But here at uh, Home Theater Geeks, of course, we like to focus on the technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what you've been doing lately is working on multi-channel mixing. Yes. In other words, taking taking audio recordings and and um, mixing them to multi-channel. Um, yes. How is how is that different as a process than mixing for two-channel? Ah, it's 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 funny. Um, when I was originally faced with uh, mixing in multi-channel several years ago, when we were we when we were merely at five point one, uh, I thought my first thought was. Oh great! This is going to take me five point one times longer to mix <laughs> <laughs> because where am I, am I going to do all this? And what happened was the actually the inverse is true because uh, I spent you know most of my life and there's still lots of engineers and dark recording studios uh, all around the world trying to mix for stereo. And when you're in stereo, you've really got to work hard to find uh, the right place in the mix for each instrument. The vocal has to be able to compete with the guitars if they're electric guitars and it's a rock band uh, and, this, and, the, and the drums and all those things. So you've got to really get in there and kind of carve out with EQ and, and dynamics uh, a voice for each, uh, for each instrument. Now in surround, um, it becomes much easier because you've got all those speakers to play with. You just simply, um, I like, there's some controversy about this, but I'm a center speaker fanatic. Uh, if you listen in other to words, any In other mind. words, you like to have a center speaker as opposed to those who prefer a phantom center without a real speaker there. I exactly, yeah, which is how, you know, most you know, mix engineers, they, they spend their whole lives, you know, mixing in stereo, and they just, they kind of, they feel very uncomfortable with putting a vocal directly in the center speaker. I happen to love it. I think it sounds incredible. It's, it's, uh, it's extremely uh, uh, intimate and you can, uh, you can just get, get a vocal just sort of right in front of your face without, again, without very much effort. You don't have to, you know, and I find that when I mix in surround, I use much less equalization, much less uh, compression uh, because um, and we're talking again, dynamic range compression there, not data compression. Right, not data compression. This is good old-fashioned dynamic range compression. What I call the original effect, uh, because <laughs> it's invented. <laughs> yeah, it was invented. If you think about it, it was invented back in the day when you know we were there trying to record things on wax cylinders, and you know any anything that jumped, you know, too loud would you know would crash the the cutting head or whatever. So that's sure. where that's where you know, dynamic range compression originally comes from. Um, hmm. And so yeah, in order to solve the limitations of the recording technology. Exactly, exactly. And now, of course, they use it to solve um, uh, problems in broadcasting. I'm thinking about 
you know, you want the dynamic range to be very narrow so that you can hear everything, no matter what yes. you're listening on, a car stereo or whatever. But that really does kind of destroy the intent of the music, doesn't it? Well, dynamic range limiting and compression can be used for good as well as evil. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's one of those things. It's, uh, I mean, I'll tell you, there's a, I have an interesting story about dynamic range compression. I was uh, producing a band many years ago, a Minneapolis band called Trip Shakespeare, who later went on to become a band called Semisonic. But um, they were very young, and uh, they, they, had, they, they were very purist about things, and they insisted that we not use any kind of compression whatsoever. Just, mm. No, 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 no compression. And so we're recording this acoustic guitar and recording this acoustic guitar, and they're just like, no, nah, it just doesn't sound right, it doesn't sound right. Of course, then one of them came, came back with uh, the next day with a copy of uh, uh, Joni Mitchell. I can't remember whether it was Blue or Court and Spark. And they said, and they said here's what we want the guitar to sound like. And of course, I listened to it, and one second I realized that was the sound of an acoustic guitar being absolutely crushed by, you know, probably at that time an 1176 or an LA 2A uh, compressor. Um, so the sound of, of com so I, like I said, compression can be used for good and, uh, and evil. And in that case, that's just the sound. When we think of a sound of an acoustic guitar recorded, um, to us, it sounds more natural to to have it compressed actually sometimes quite heavy handedly um uh, so yeah it's an interesting subject it's it's yeah. uh, it's, an on, it's an ongoing uh but i think the kind of thing you're talking about is what we call uh, bus compression um and that's gotten really out of hand over the last 10 to 15 years uh with the uh, digital compre uh, compression um available in these workstations uh, like Pro Tools or Nuendo or Logic, whatever hap whatever you happen to use, um, people just kind of go crazy with it because it's like it's a button. It, it, it makes you lazy because it's a, you basically press that button and it just instantly sounds like it's on the radio, mm. and uh, people get lazy about it. And they also the other big beef with uh, dynamic range compression on the final output buts is that if you actually take a look at the waveform of popular records you know pop music and you you know you pull you rip something off a cd and ha have a look at it it basically looks just like a gigantic square wave but there's no <laughs> there's no dynamic range at all and that's 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 a problem I, in yeah. my opinion yeah and getting back to five one you just uh mixing for surround you just don't have to do that because you've you've got the freedom of the extra speakers uh you've you've got the extra dynamic range just because of the the, the format itself, um, mm -hmm. so it's quite it was quite liberating. You know, in a long story short, sure, um, sure, you know, and and uh, that, and the best part is there are no rules. You know, some guys go absolutely no vocals all by themselves in the center speaker, and other people like me mm -hmm. love that. You know, yeah, well, certainly I've felt that in the early days of surround music mixes, there were a lot of sort of gimmicky things that were going on. Uh, Chipper Dog in the chat room says, uh, mentions the ping pong stereo from the 60s and 70s, 70s right. uh, pop hits, you know, and, and a lot of that kind of stuff was going on in the early days of uh, surround music mixing. Uh, whereas today, I think um, engineers have a lot more experience and they do a much better job of integrating a sound field that surrounds you without these all these sorts of gimmicks wouldn't you agree uh absolutely yeah it's definitely the the art of mixing music in particular for surround has has matured i know i've i've matured because you know i used to do that stuff i'm sort of guilty of <laughs> flying around the room but um yeah. in certain instances it's it's perfectly appropriate i uh here at dts we used to have a record label called dts entertainment uh, where we would put out surround uh, mixes uh, in the, uh, I think we did we did DVDA before that we had DTS music disc, mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember mixed, D DTS CDs. That's right. Yeah. DTS encoded CDs. That's right. Yeah. You can still make them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. Exactly it, right. It's um, part of our current our state of the art encoder suite um, has the ability. You still have the ability to make a DTS music CD, which is mm. good fun. Uh, Chipper Dog in the chat room asks, did you ever dabble in quadraphonic back in the day? No, other than 
other than being over at a, a friend's house when I was probably, you know, 14 and he had a quad system and I think we listened to to uh, some Yes record, like Relay or something. <laughs> Sorry. I remember I remember being in high school listening to that, something like yeah. that on a friend's quad system as well. Um, uh, no, but what's fun is there... There's a there's a lot of that stuff still out there. Uh, there's the, and some companies have been reissuing it. I think there was recently, it was maybe Ryko or somebody released. I think it was a Chicago album. Um, they released the original quad mix. Um, on, wow! In, uh, in four channels. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And there's there, there's there's a lot of that stuff in vaults still. There's you know, and then there's a. There's sort of an underground society of people that go and find these things and they turn right. them into, uh, you know, swappable files and whatnot. I won't get too detailed about that. But yeah, it goes right. to show there's a lot of interest in it. And it's really yeah, fun yeah. to go back well, and hear what they were playing around with back then. Right. Sandman in the chat room asks a, a really uh, pertinent question, which goes to the heart of what we're talking about here. How many channels do we really need? <laughs> <laughs> We're about to get into Neo X, uh, yeah. which is DTS's new th um, newest algorithm, which goes up to eleven. Goes up to <laughs> eleven, to, indeed. To, to quote uh, um, Spinal Tap, Nigel Tufnell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, how I many can't... channels do we really need? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I can't believe our uh, our, our marketing part department, some of whom are in the room with me, never thought of it goes to eleven. But maybe maybe we'll use that in the coming, uh, <laughs> coming ad months. campaign. Yeah, you should. Neo X, many, it goes to eleven. Yeah, how many speakers do we really need? Well, that's that's a really good question. Um, it's it sort of goes like this: once you hear five one, you never want to go back to stereo. Once you hear seven one, you don't want to go back to five one, and once you hear eleven one, you're just, you know, it's one order of magnitude more immersive is the is is the answer. So, mm -hmm. as how many speakers do you need? As many as you feel comfortable with, uh, be, and we're DTS. One of DTS's main philosophies is is we're that we're quite proud of is our backwards compatibility. Uh, uh, we everything we do is is backwards compatible. So, for example, if you went out and had a, you know had gotten a Blu-ray disc, um, a Blu-ray player, you know, a couple of years ago when it was when things were new and you didn't have your AV receiver with all the modern HDMI on it, you could still take the digital out out of that Blu-ray player, plug it into the digital in SPDIF or, uh, you know, toss link or coax, and that AVR receiver, even though the, there was DTS master audio, possibly at 192K, 24-bit, um, that AVR would be able to see the DTS core, what we call the core, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and play it back for you to the best of its abilities. Uh, so, you know, and the same, the same thing applies for 11.1. Um, um, you can, you, you'll always be able to hear that, those mixes in uh, from down to 7.1, down to 5.1, down to stereo. You don't right. lose anything. So, so the important thing to, to realize here, and, and one thing I do, I agree with you completely that DTS got this right, uh, is that there's a core uh, piece of data that virtually any device can decode, and then there's this extra stuff around it that if you can decode it, great, you get the advantage of, of the extra channels, the extra uh, bandwidth, the extra frequency response, and so on. Um, but if you don't have that capability, you can still accept that data stream and ignore all that extra stuff and just listen to the core. Yeah, what we, what we call uh, coherent acoustics is the, mm -hmm. our core, which is a, to get all nerdy, it's a 1.5 megabits per second stream stereo right <laughs> two channel uh no that's that would be five one or even five one at 1.5 megabits okay correct okay yeah. um <clears throat> i've actually uh, you can a, actually do it it's, you can actually do 768 too if, if you oh even worse yeah even lower yeah even have lower. you have has dts i'm sure you must have done um listening tests blind listening tests to see at what point 
lossy compression becomes indistinguishable from lossless? Uh, actually, that's one of the things that I do here. Uh, I, part of my gig is, uh, you know, we're, we're in constant search for uh, low bitrate solutions for uh, across all kinds of platforms. Uh, right, with portable we, uh, and mobile, mobile stuff happening so frequently, uh, so often now, uh, it, it would seem to me important to, to know that. Yeah, so, yeah, low bitrate, you know, transparency is kind of the, the, the holy grail. Uh, it, it never... Uh, you know, it, we're all still searching for the best uh, p possible way to do that to get to get the best possible audio quality across uh, multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. And then you mm -hmm. and you start talking about cloud connected devices and lossless. And I want my lossless, but I also need to I want to be able to like put it on my MP3 player or my my phone or whatever. And how do you how do you deal with all that stuff? That's part of and that's part of what we're also working on these days. So yes, we do. I do perform. I personally perform many, many blind listening tests. And the the there's no easy answer. Uh, we have a we have several pieces of uh, test material where uh, uh, you know one piece of music will just absolutely thrash a low bit rate code, uh, whereas the, another piece of music going through the same codec will seem almost completely transparent. So it's, it's, uh, it's it depends tricky. on the content to one degree. Oh yes, very much so. Very much. And so. I think it also depends, wouldn't you agree on the listener that there are listeners who are trained to know what to listen for. And mm -hmm. there are listeners we might call naive listeners. That is people mm -hmm. who aren't trained. I, I don't mean that as a derogatory term at all, just Right. simply people who don't have the training to know what to listen for. And I would think that trained listeners would be able to identify lossy codecs more than naive listeners. Uh, true, true. But I think, you know, it's, it, this is, raises an interesting point. There are, there are some, I think that people do know or do hear uh, artifacts of lossy uh, but they don't, they just, they don't realize what's going on. Ah. For example, there's a, there's a, a certain uh, ooh, television service provider that has a, a DVR and uh, the, I won't mention them by name or anything. And cause you you can if you want. Them. No, no, I won't do that. You'd rather not, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather not. But I used to notice that when I recorded some of, some of these shows um and i play them back from the dvr i have to turn the show away i could not hear what they were saying i just couldn't hear the dialogue and i thought oh gosh i'm getting old and can't hear anymore and then i'd see the same show like on a live broadcast and realize oh no that's that's not me that's that's the darn codec that's used in that particular dvr and i mm. think some i think people have probably had that experience where they're just you know, they go to listen back to something or they go to a certain channel and they're on whatever network they happen to be on and uh, they start turning it up and, and, and making adjustments because they want to hear the dialogue and they're, and they're having trouble hearing it. That's, right. that's a codec gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, people, I think normal people can hear that. They just don't realize what they're hearing is a bad Right, codec. right. They might not be able to explain it or describe it particularly, but they can yeah. tell right away that something's up. Something's wrong, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, before we get to NeoX specifically, I, I actually have a few questions in the chat room getting back to the whole issue of dynamic range compression, mm. um, which is, uh, I have a question, let's see, a, uh, a. Barron says, I have a question regarding compression in 5.1 for CD. What's a music group to do if they want to get radio play? Don't the stations expect it to be normalized or compressed, really? Um... You know, I don't know what they expect because they compress the heck out of it also. <laughs> exactly. The radio station does on the way out. So yeah, the yeah. Uh, music group doesn't necessarily have to deliver a highly compressed track, right? Uh, that's right. That's exactly right. But part of the, the theory, you know, going back to the earlier day, you know, like maybe 10, 15, year, 15 years ago when people started to really squash stuff was they wanted – you know, when that when their record or their CD came on, they wanted it to be louder. Right now, 
Which That's is very analogous, by the way. Just let me point out that it's very analogous to uh, TV manufacturers who, who's, um, who, who set their basic settings, picture settings, to be very bright, very blue, so that it stands out on the showroom floor. Just like yeah. uh, th th this, in this case, the, mu the artist wants their music to be louder than the next group so that it uh, gets more attention. Yep. And so it goes, and so it goes. <laughs> Um, I, I, I know I saw one here earlier in the chat room. I can't find it at the moment, but uh, someone was asking uh, if you could um, give an example of uh, <clears throat> of, of good, uh, of well compressed recordings. We should say. Uh, well, boy, anything from the seventies, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> they did a good job in the seventies, huh? Yeah, they did. It seemed, you know, I was thinking about that as, as I was thinking about what we were going to talk about today, and. Uh, I don't know why this crossed my mind, but I was just thinking, you know, if somebody ever asked me what was the, you know, when was the pinnacle of the art of, you know, recording audio? Yeah. Uh, I, it's got to be, you know, mid, late 70s into the early 80s, and then it all went to hell. <laughs> <laughs> now, right. mind you, there have been some great recordings, but I'm sort of, let, let me, I'll, I'll just say that I'm just limiting my my criticism to, you know, pretty much top 40 popular music because there have been a lot of great recordings, you know. Um, since then. At, yeah, since then and still and today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So somebody's got to put their foot down and say, no, I'm <laughs> going to record it like this and mix it like this because this is how right. it should be. And I'm not really going to worry too much about whether when the you know britney spears comes on next i'm going to be quieter than, than one of her tracks right right i've always thought that steely dan's uh recordings were among the best oh. engineered recordings yeah the the yeah the pinnacle that was the the gold standard um you know back during those days you know mm -hmm. you could only hope to approach that that level of quality, mind you, it took them forever to make their records. So right, the right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Donald Fagan, I, I hear, was a, an incredible perfectionist who, you know, did hundreds of mixes of, of each tune just to get little <laughs> tiny details right. But you know, I mean, the the result shows, uh, you know, that it, maybe it was worth it. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, uh, Beatmaster asked a different question. Um, could you ask how far DTS and DTSMA pass through needs to be licensed? Media player brands blame always DTS when they don't implement it. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I understand the question entirely. Maybe you do. I I think the yeah the the that's a question of uh, of that's like about our, our our business model and we what we do is we we sell our intellectual property to AVR manufacturers and various mm -hmm. hardware manufacturers um, to be able to decode um, the DTS stream. Um, there are some media players that technically you have to license our, our technology to be able to play sure. it back. So. Sure. But you're not alone in that. I mean, Dolby does the same thing. That's correct. Yeah. You know, you got to license it. Yeah. Uh, Midnight Midnight Rider asks: Is it possible to get DTS demo discs? I know that, uh, that you make <laughs> them available to to us in the press and and members of the industry, uh, and they're wonderful demo discs. I have to say, I use them all the time. Uh, are, do you ever make them available to the general public? No, we do not. Um, it's it's pure. It's strictly for uh, consumer electronics industry and press and uh but you can if you want to if you want to come to ces and stand in line at our booth you can get one other than that, <laughs> that that's the only way to get one only way <laughs> to get to one say. well i i certainly yeah. look forward to it every year myself and i i will say this as an aside that um uh consumers technology enthusiasts can in fact now attend ces if you join the cea the consumer electronics association tech enthusiast program. I don't know how much yeah. it costs, but but consumers can now get access to CES, which uh, easier than they used to be able to. So I always think that's uh, that's a good thing. I think that's a great idea. Did, was, was, the la was last year the first time they... they I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, well, before we get back to DTS Neo X, which is mm -hmm. uh, 
one important thing that I really want to discuss here. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, Netflix. Uh, you can stream thousands of TV uh, episodes and movies with Netflix from just about any device, uh, computers, of course, PCs, Macs, also most TVs and uh, Blu-ray players, uh, game consoles, Xbox 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii. You can, uh, iPhone, uh, mobile phones and smartphones, you can stream Netflix from just about anything these days. And uh, it's so much easier than dealing with discs and so on. Uh, th as I said, thousands of episodes and movies available instantly um, uh, right to your device whenever you need it in high definition as well. Uh, and you can begin watching a movie or show in one, on one device and finish on another. And whichever you, device you, you uh, choose to access, you can watch as many as you want anytime you want for one low fixed Price. And you can cancel any time. To try Netflix for 30 days, go to netflix.com slash twit. And be sure to use that URL for your free trial, netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix for their support of this show and all of the twit network. Uh, and most of our audience, we're sure, already is uh, our Netflix subscribers. So uh, we hope you will help spread the word. So, um, Fred Marr, we want to get back to uh, DTS Neo X. Now we've seen Neo uh, Six, I think. Six, yeah. Was was the last one? Uh, why X? <laughs> uh, that we decided that since we weren't quite sure how many channels there could be <laughs> potentially, <laughs> we'd better just start using an X instead of make the, it a variable. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And how, how many channels can can we uh, can we see or hear uh, from Neo X now? Well, Neo X is it's it's technically it's an upmix um, algorithm uh, because and, and what we do with it is uh, from a, a blue the Blu-ray spec calls for uh, seven point one or eight channels in total. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a that's a limitation of the of the current Blu-ray spec. So. Uh, we created uh, Neo X as a way of doing um, upmixes from um, anything from stereo and 5.1 and 7.1 uh, to expand the uh, sort of immersiveness to 11.1 channels. Um, and what I've been doing um, is I've been actually creating um, actual 11.1 channel mixes with, uh, in, in this very room right here. I'll just give you a quick. I'm going to. I'm going to tilt up here and show you. There's a. There's a circular truss. I don't know if you can see that. But oh yeah, a, sure. We've got a 5.1 uh, plus plus voice of God uh, speaker, which hangs directly. <laughs> <up>. <laughs> um, so I actually do 11.1 um, one mixes, uh, pure discrete. And what I wind up with at the end, of course, is. You know, when you're mixing for stereo, just to just to fill you in on the on the workflow, when you're mixing for stereo, you start out with a multi-track, could be anything from you know 24 to 48 to 200 tracks, mm -hmm. and you're mixing down to uh, two, right? So that's that would be your output bus, your stereo output bus from your mix. So you wind up with a stereo mix of all those right. elements. And, and as and as you said earlier, you have to be very conscious of where you place each instrument between essentially those two speakers exactly exactly so um when i'm create when i'm creating something for ne for neo x reproduction uh, i actually create an 11 one mix so i've got 12 channels of audio and the easy way to think of it um it just from a, a layout or specification uh, level is that it's 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 7.1 uh with two uh, extra wide speakers, which are located between the side surround and the front surround, and mm -hmm. two extra height speakers, uh, which are uh, uh, left uh, and right height. So I will actually. And, are, by, and by the way, before you go on, I've got a couple questions in the chat room about exactly this: where are all these speakers placed? And the height channels are they directly above the front, the main front, right and left, or are they a little bit outside of that? Uh, horizontal position. Uh, they're a little bit outside, and they're a little bit actually over, because what we 
what we're trying to do is create like a semi spherical uh, area mm-hmm. uh, so that so they're not they don't just go straight up from above the the front speakers they actually they actually come in a little bit uh, over your just a little yeah. bit over your head they are, they are the same code, distance code in so, yeah, it, yeah. sort of but but on a vertical axis rather than a horizontal axis yeah and they are they are situated just slightly outside of, of left and right okay. So that gives uh, it, you have 7.1, 8, 9 wide speakers, which are, which are outside of the front right and left, but still on the same plane. And then correct. these two height speakers make 11. Correct. And then the subwoofer, of course. Right? And then the subwoofer. Um, Good point. And uh, PC guy asks, how does it sound different from 5.1? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Great question. Yeah, it sounds a lot different. I mean, the the extra wide speakers um, uh, on the horizontal plane uh, give you a, a, a better experience. Like if you know, if a, if a car is racing by or, or a horse and buggy, whatever, <laughs> there's less, <laughs> there's less right. there are less holes in the sound field, so it's a really smooth uh, sound field. But when you bring height into the equation, um, you'd be really surprised by how much energy you can perceive from above. So when you're mixing, you know, for film, for things like flyovers or people shouting down, you know, the top of a well or something and, or, or thunderclaps, um, it, the, the, the energy that comes from height speakers is, is amazing. And it, it's just, it's just that much, again, it's another order of magnitude of, of, of immersion. So it's mm-hmm. from five one. It's hugely different, right? <clears throat> now the problem, one of the problems that I see right away with an eleven point one system, as good as it is, with your eleven point one mixes, uh, there are no Blu rays available with eleven point one soundtracks. <laughs> so no. how how do you get there? Yeah, not yet. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're, sure. We're about to actually we're about to publish a white paper describing uh, what I was actually going to get to uh, with how I, how I do the uh, the eleven point one mix. Again, um, you got to remember Blu-ray. It's not. We're not saying that they're going that they're we're not specifying uh, twelve channels because Blu-ray doesn't take twelve channels. So. I'll go back to, to where I was before. Is if I yes, I'm, I'm out, sorry. I, I, I sidetracked you. So let's get back to that, and we'll get to this, to this point here soon enough, I'm sure. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just sort of weave back into where we were. Um, so I'll create um, what I wind up, like analogous to the, to the idea of the mix down of the stereo stem, uh, when you're mixing in surround of any flavor, 5.1 or 7.1, you wind up with, a, with in 5.1, you wind up with uh, six channels, of audio, mm-hmm. seven one you wind up with eight channels of audio, and eleven one you wind up with uh, twelve channels of audio. Mm-hmm. Now, in a seven one uh, mix, what I'll do is I'll, when I'm getting ready to encode for Blu-ray, I take the the eight channels: uh, left, right, center, LFE, left side surround, right side surround, left rear surround, right rear surround, and those channels uh, they just go directly into the encoder. And what comes out the other end is a single stream, which gets authored to the Blu-ray disc. Right now, when I've got a twelve one, an, uh, sorry, an eleven one mix uh, or group of tracks, I there's a there's a second uh, step to the uh, that I do before the encode, and that is I have to down mix the eleven point one channels into a seven point one mix. So what I do is I take the twelve stems. And I locate the, uh, again, this is w- within a DAW, within a mixing uh, application. A DAW, Di- or Digital Audio Workstation. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry to get the alphabet suit. That's okay. Suit. No problem. <laughs> um, I'll take the, I take the wide uh, channels, and I pan them um, phantom between uh, side left and front left. Would be the left wide, and then phantom between uh, right front and side, mm-hmm. right side, and then the 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 channels that are intended for the height speaker are panned exactly phantom between front and rear surround. 
right? So I, I disable the side surround speaker. So that's, that sound exists only in that single spot. Now, if you listen to it, um, that mix that I've prepared in a normal 7-1 system, it sounds perfectly normal and fine. There's nothing, there's nothing odd about it. Things aren't in strange places. But if you uh, have it playing through a, a system capable of NeoX decoding, um, the decoder actually picks up on that, that perfectly correlated audio between those, those extra channels mm -hmm. and extracts it and puts it right into the speakers that I originally intended. So this is uh, somewhat like matrixing. Yes, it's a it's a matrix it's a matrix down mix. So again, it's not an encode encode. It's a mm -hmm. what you call like a matrix encode. Right. And that's that's in preparation for uh, for Neo X. Um, we call that optimizing for Neo X. Right. Neo X, of course, will take seven one material and take do the same thing. It'll take stuff that correlates. It follows the exact same rules. Fortunately, those rules kind of work out. <laughs> so if something's <laughs> going rather suddenly from front to back, like a flyover or something, it'll actually redirect to that height speaker. And if it's something that correlates precisely between uh, side surround and front, it'll actually extract it and put it directly into a speaker. Instead of it being phantom, it becomes very anchored in that extra mm. speaker. Um, yeah, the, there was a question in the chat room earlier about what happens if you only have a 5.1 or a 7.1 coming in, uh, even if it's not optimized, as you've just described, if you the mic are the mixer and you know you want to create something that's going to end up being 11.1, you can, you can encode it or matrix it. But if somebody didn't do that, then the, the algorithm is going to treat it as if it were essentially, right? Um, e yes, the algorithm will, will take correlated information uh, and redirect it to the extra speakers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there, a, a great example of this is we have a, I mean, we play around with a lot of discs here, but we happen to have the, you know, the, the, that movie Pearl Harbor from I don't know, one, eight, nine years ago. Sure. Uh, that works great with Neo X. <laughs> oh, really? Those, plane, those planes go right up into the height speakers, like just. Ah, bang. interesting. Yeah. Um, so, I heard. I, have you tried? By the way, have you tried um, the movie Wally? No. Because I saw a demo of of Wally being put through the Odyssey a DSX mm -hmm. algorithm, and one scene was. Uh, the, the little robot Wally was was climbing up a ramp, and mm. darned if the if the sound didn't come up into the height speaker as he was moving oh, up that ramp. So it'd be something to check out. I, I I'm, I'm I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so is DTX is uh, DTS Neo X available yet to consumers? Yeah, I don't know if you saw it. I actually sent you the uh, URL for the the new um, Ankyo, um What is it called? The T N T Z dash N one thousand and nine. I believe oh, yeah. is mm -hmm. that's the first T X dash N R one thousand nine. Yeah. Yeah. There, there you go. Uh, yeah, that's that's shipping right now. That's available. Okay. That is technically will only drive nine point one speakers. But they're they will be uh, they're going to be producing uh, eleven one systems uh, supposedly in this quarter mm. or the next quarter. Uh, we've got uh, Sony is going to be producing a Neo X AVR, and um, Denon is on track to have a, a true eleven one Neo X AVR out by. Um... Oh yeah. There's the uh, TXNR1009 on the screen for those who are watching the video. And uh, I guess it's the first one with Neo X, right? That's right, yeah. It's the first one. You yeah, so, haven't seen uh, it in that color. The, the, one that, the two that we have over here are black. Oh. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> also available in lovely silver tone. <laughs> silver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so then the question really becomes, <laughs> um, how do you, uh, well... How do you justify to your spouse 
say say you're in a mm. relationship and one of you is a geek and one of you isn't. Uh, the spousal acceptance factor or SAF of uh, of eleven yes. speakers in the room is uh, probably a little challenging. Any recommendations or advice for convinc <laughs> convincing your other half that, honey, I really do want these extra speakers hanging from the ceiling. It's going to be so cool. <laughs> yes, the spousal uh, acceptance factor. It's been around for many years now, ever since probably we went from mono to stereo. It was probably a problem sure. even back then. Uh, no advice on, on how to convince uh convince anyone to <laughs> convince somebody else to do that <laughs> but we do often get asked like you know come on guys really 11 1 and there's a lot of reasons why we do it um you know i like to say you know there are some people that actually buy lamborghinis and you know there, there aren't very many of them but uh, they would probably love to have 11 speakers in their media room or their home theater mm -hmm. um but the other, the other way we look at it is we, we kind of look at this development that we do in the same way that maybe um, auto manufacturers look at, uh, say, uh, Formula One racing. You know, they, they, I, don't, I don't even know how much it costs to build an F1 car. It's probably several million dollars. Sure. And, and it's very nice to, to win races, and people love F1. It's one of the most popular sports on earth, I'm told. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all benefit from all the research and development that goes into those cars. Those cars have given us, well, seat belts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that. Yeah, uh, anti-lock brakes, um, mm -hmm. you know, probably airbags, uh, you know, tip, sh tiptronic shifters, and there's all kinds of things, but safety features and all kinds of things that trickle down from that, in, you know, originally, like, insanely expensive and out-of-this-world technology into our everyday lives. So um, we, we're always pushing the limits, uh, you know, because, A, it's fun and it, it's really cool, but it also helps us uh, take some of that, that knowledge um, and, and helps us uh, develop um, other kinds of technology. Like the first thing we think of, it, you know, when we go, okay, so here we, we've done it. We've got 11.1. Now, now, how do we virtualize that? How do we get mm. that down to maybe um, somebody who might have a sound bar and a couple of speakers? just over their TV, you mm -hmm. know, and height is becoming, I've just personally noticed this, that height is becoming something that people are actually interested in. I was, I don't know, I was at Sears a couple of weeks ago and I saw a bunch of, you know, kind of inexpensive home theater in a box type systems. Um, now you often see in, in, in retail, you see like all the, all the speakers like piled up right next to each other and it yeah. makes absolutely no sense and you can't hear what it sounds like. But I've noticed that one company in particular actually has started to say, no, put, them, put, put a pair of speakers up there, you know, put a pair of speakers down here and maybe put a couple in the back. Um, so what I'm getting to is that uh, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn from it and then take what we learn and optimize it uh, for across many platforms. And, mm -hmm. you know, along with that is always, you know, the, the, the DTS Clarion call, which is backwards compatibility. You know, if you, if you, if you've got the gear and you want to, you want to go there, you can get, you know, the best that there is. Uh, if you, if you don't have that, we're also, we're trying to take, what we learn from uh, developing these technologies and bring the best possible, best quality audio that we can into things down as small as um, cell phones and tablets and mm -hmm. things like that. Well, I think it's a, it's a great uh, way to, to think about it. And the analogy of uh, race cars and so on is a good one. I also, it also brings to mind um, uh, the space program mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, we've, we've derived a lot of benefit everyday benefit from the space program uh, that was originally thought of as uh, wh why are we even doing this um, but again it's it's to it's to push the boundaries it's to push the envelope it's to see what happens when we go that far and then how can we bring that back into a practical application yeah, you've hit the nail on the head yeah there you go that's that's why I referred to myself as the space monkey in the beginning <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that we were 
that I was that I work with the R and D team. Um, it's fun. I get to play around with a lot of nutty stuff that I unfortunately can't talk about. <laughs> oh, well, I was I was that was going to be my last question, but now I know I can't <laughs> ask it. Uh, a magpie in the chat room has been been asking uh, here. Um, uh, oh, it just it just slipped away from me here. Hang on a second, and I'll get it. Um, uh, how do you prefer? This is just sort of a, a mixing question, multi-channel. Uh, how do you prefer to compensate for wild phase differences from many multi-channel from a many multi-channel master? Ooh, yeah, that's that's the recording engineer's fault. I mean, that's the first thing I want to say. <laughs> okay, shouldn't have been, it shouldn't have that shouldn't have happened to begin with. But I mean, all you can do is experiment um, with flipping phase on important pairs, um, and sometimes I just wind up throwing things away and just not, you know, not using them. Or I'll even take um, you. Usually, this this sort of stuff happens with too many too many microphones on a drum set without getting too complicated. Sure. And sometimes I'll just throw one of the, you know, and it's usually in pairs. So sometimes I'll just throw one half of it away, you know, and, mm, just, and that takes, that yeah. takes care of the phase problem right yeah. there. Yeah. You just, you just <laughs> limited the, the possibility of, uh, phase problems. But, uh, right. one, one, uh, sorry, going back to Neo X that I, I did want to mention that, um, we, we consider Neo X, I mean, one of the other reasons that we created it was the, uh, was the answer, uh, to the, to the consum consumer electronics industry's, uh, you know, quantum leap into 3D, uh, yeah. and and the demand for uh, 3D audio. Uh, yes, so we, we were going to talk about that. So I'm glad you brought yeah, that up. You know, we consider Neo X to be our first, our first step into the realm of 3D audio, but it's just our first step. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've got there, there's more more to come. In over time, um, and I think the other thing that's important to talk about when you're talking about 3D audio is um, is you know there's a there's a sort of a sidebar discussion about like well is this is, is this 3D stuff really gonna is this gonna stick is this gonna take off is everybody really gonna want to wear these darn glasses and mm -hmm. is and all that stuff and I I I understand the uh, the uh, people's trepidation about about 3d video um when done as we all know when done well it is absolutely amazing and when done done poorly it's uh, nauseating <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> uh, you know i always uh, say this uh, leo laporte and i disagree somewhat about 3d he just doesn't you know, like a, it period yeah he's a big 3d hater i know i've, yeah, I've heard yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you've heard yeah and and i i take your position which is when it's done well, I really like it. I think it's great. I don't mind wearing the glasses, and it, it really adds something to me. Uh, but yeah. when it's done poorly, as you say, it's nauseating, literally. Literally, and yeah, it gives you, you know, it gives you headaches and yeah. Uh, but to that, to that point, we we feel that three D audio is is valid uh, with or without three uh, D video. Mm -hmm. So. We're 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 determined to 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 press on um, with three D audio. Now, uh, uh, Neo X uh, and eleven point one in a way is three D audio already. Although I've often said, I will tell you this right now, and I'll say it again, that what most people call three D audio, a lot of people call surround sound three D audio, and I don't because it's still in one plane around your Correct. head. Uh, whereas uh, Neo X. And uh, a couple other systems actually put these height speakers up there. Now you're starting to get into what's really 3D audio. Exactly. Now you're talking. <laughs> and, and can you imagine uh, the day when you'd have even more than just those two height speakers, when you might have, you know, four or six or eight speakers all the way around and creating a true hemispherical sound field? Yes, I can. I, in fact, I have. <laughs> <laughs> because I have them here. You but got them right it, there, yeah. Yeah, is, yeah. Is that more than 11.1 system you have in your studio there? Oh, golly. We've got uh, – you're going to have to come out here one day, Scott. I know. Oh, yeah, I intend to. <laughs> and actually me, see this place. We've got about 22 speakers in this room 
uh, four of which are subwoofers. Ah, right, exactly. Web 2688 points to a Wikipedia article about 22.2 uh, surround ah. sound. Now, now that's, that gets really, I don't know how much time we've got left here. We've got, <laughs> we got another five minutes. All right, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, 22.2 is, um, is a system that was developed by NHK, which is the, I believe, the Japanese National, Japanese National Broadcasting Television. Yeah. yeah. And man, had they got a great R&D department. They, they, they push the limits. They, you know, they get people on board with standards. You know, they were talking about 4K video, you know, years before it was even possible. And I've, I'm sure, you, I don't know if you attend NAB, but they've always I got do. this absolutely amazing uh, thing. But anyway, 22.2. Okay. We feel that that, that is it's it's valid, but it's it's really those are for more for like permanent installations, like uh, theme parks or certain special, maybe you know IMAX type situations. Um, uh, it's a it's a system that is you 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 can't get into it on the content create onto the in the content creation side, excuse me, realistically, and you can't play it back. There's no way to play it back realistically. So it's it's yeah. Talk, really cool talk about the negative spousal acceptance factor. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty twenty two speakers plus two subwoofers in the room. Yeah, no. yeah, it's a bit much. Uh, you know, that's that's arguably three D sound, uh, but again, it's it's uh, you know that's it's more of a permanent installation type. What, that, what that's about that's simulated? It. What about simulated three D surround? I know SRS is working on this, uh, where they actually have a pretty convincing. Uh, 3D sound field coming from, you know, a pair of speakers in front, which is all totally well, simulated. Um, uh, is DTS working on something like that? Uh, we, well, we work with, uh, we have some simulation stuff. We have some products in the market right now. Uh, there's uh, one that's basically for PC, for headphones um, or, or, or laptop called Surround Sensation. Mm -hmm. And that will take uh, stereo and upmix it to a virtual surround. It'll also take a discrete uh, five one uh, input and try attempt to recreate the actual original positioning of that of that content um, through what we call uh, HRTFs. In fact, we don't we didn't name them that. That's just a thing that exists in nature. Head Which, by the way, stands for head related transfer function. Yes, good my 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 geek. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay it's totally uh, fine it's just this is home theater geeks after all yeah well um you know an hrtf technology not dissimilar to what we were talking about before with uh, uh low bit rate uh, coding technology um there's there's still room for uh experimentation and uh, de and development of that mm -hmm. and we are we are looking into that as, uh, yeah, as somebody, said, in, the, already, somebody in the chat room asked about 3d headphones and and it sounds like you've sort of answered that question at least in terms of surround that you can simulate surround in uh in a pair of headphones and i assume at some point uh, you probably are already working on simulating true 3d sound in headphones it's um, I'm not sure if I can say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to All be right. uh, cagey. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, there was one other question in here. Let's see if I can find it about uh, plugins for PCs. Uh, and and there was some indication, I can't find it right now in the chat room, but uh, that uh, they seem to be implying that DTS does not yet have uh, plugins f uh, for PCs. Is that true? Uh, we have a actually we have an upmix uh, uh, plugin that runs uh, VST and RTAS. Um, which oh, is, those are for those are uh, professional audio um, formats for for digital audio workstations, right? Yeah, yeah. Is I'm not sure if that's what the the question. No, was the, I think the question was more for the consumer. Oh, do the, oh, you mean? Um, well, yeah. There's uh, I don't know if plugin is the right word, but there's. Um, Boy, I can't think of the brands off the top of my head, but there are there are a few uh, PC manufacturers that are using our uh, what we call 
APOs, um, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, when you go into the PC and you go into the control panel and you go into the sound tab and you hit advanced and there's all this stuff in there, like uh, enhancements and various things like that. We are in a few of the a few uh, PCs, a few laptops hmm. at this point. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, with that, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour, and I want to thank you so much, Fred Marr, for being uh, on the podcast. Uh, you can get uh, Fred's information of what they're what he's doing at DTS at dts.com, of course. And mm -hmm. uh, Fred, thanks so much. Thank you, Scott. It's been a pleasure. This was great. Yeah, let's do it again. <laughs> let's do it again. I agree. Uh, my online homes, of course, I only have one now. It's hometheater.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next Monday is Labor Day, so we're off. Uh, but the week after that, uh, home theater editor Rob Sabin, uh, video editor Tom Norton, and I are going to be wrapping up what we saw, what we will have seen, to use the proper tense, at the Cedia Convention. Uh, consumer, ele uh, consumer Electronics, Custom Electronics Design and Installation Association, the second biggest trade show of the year for us. Uh, mostly high-end stuff. We hear rumors of 4K video projectors uh, for the home, uh, which will be very interesting. We're going to see a lot of interesting stuff there, I'm sure. So, uh, And we're going to wrap it all up for you in two weeks from now. So I sure hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out.